All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the uh, clinical case discussions. Um, this is a, a session that I've participated in uh, over the years several times, and it's always uh, really a great session. Um, obviously, during COVID, we had to do this online. It's great to to really have this session back up and running and to have uh, a really uh, good participation uh, in terms of the audience. Um, before I introduce um, in, uh, you here today, I just want to make a couple comments about the format. Um, so we do have some questions that are coming in online, um, and obviously uh, uh, questions that, that, many, that many of you want to bring up. I'm going to ask that as you bring these questions to the mic that you be very succinct. Sometimes there's a tendency um, to want to ask two or three or four questions. Uh, out of one case, and I think it's going to be very difficult to do that. So I'd ask you to be succinct with your question, really no more than a minute, and then we'll allow uh, the panelists to provide uh, uh, input. Um, I would like to uh, um, just introduce uh, our panelists today, um, starting from all the way on uh, your right, um, Dr. Andrea uh, uh, Berrio. Am I saying your last name correct? Okay, from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, uh, next to her, uh, we have Bev Saltzman, who is a patient advocate from Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Uh, next to her, we have Dr. Lori Pierce from the University of Michigan. Uh, we then have uh, Dr. Alex Pratt uh, uh, from the hospital clinic in Barcelona. Uh, next to him, we have Dr. Erica Mayer uh, from the Dana-Farber. Uh, next to Erica, we have Dr. Nadia Harbeck uh, from University Hospital in Munich. And then finally, uh, right to my left, uh, we have Dr. Barbara Pastilli from, uh, uh, fr from Gustave Roussy from France. So with that, I'm going to go ahead um, and just uh, one other housekeeping item. Uh, I did want to uh, give, uh, uh, give Bev just a quick uh, an opportunity to comment on a website. Uh, Bev, do you want to go do that? Hi, everybody. I'm Bev Salzman Lewin. And um, I am a veteran of three different cancers, including breast cancer, uh, but uh, also used to be in charge of research for CNN's national desk. And so when I got my first diagnosis, I experienced what all patients do, which is that amygdala hijack, where even if you are incredibly smart, did great in school, it's very hard to think clearly and stay calm when you've been given a difficult diagnosis like breast cancer. So I naturally went back and used my professional research skills to create a simple system that I used in order to calm myself, learn what I needed to learn in order to make good decisions on doctors and on treatment. And uh, so anyway, fast forward, I had a terrible scare a couple years ago, which thank God turned out to be absolutely nothing. And so I decided I wanted to use the gratefulness that I felt. I had been helping different people, friends, and people in my own life through their difficult diagnoses. Um, but I decided to put my, my strategy, the things that had helped me, up on a website, totally public service, in hopes that other patients might be able to um, derive some benefit and uh, make it easier to get through, especially that very difficult time for patients between receiving the diagnosis and making your decisions on doctors and treatment. So anyway, uh, I think they've got the, the homepage up there, and um, feel free to share it with your patients and anybody who you think might benefit. It's not just for cancer, but obviously that's what I know. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, let's go ahead with the first question. Um, Dr. Karen Green, medical. I'm going to hold off just for a second before I can. Um, Dr. Hope Rugo just arrived, um, uh, and actually, we're very pleased she's here. Dr. Hope Rugo from University of California, San Francisco. Please go ahead. Okay, medical oncologist, White Plains Hospital, New York. 48-year-old um, premenopausal woman presents earlier this year with a clinical T2 clinically node positive. Um, uh, poorly differentiated invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, ultrasound guided biopsy of the breast lesion shows uh, ER 21 to 30 percent weak, um, but biopsy of the lymph node was triple negative. Uh, she also had a contralateral DCIS 
on MRI guided biopsy. Um, PET scan was negative for distant disease except for one solitary um, abdominal wall metastasis, about one to two centimeters. So in multidisciplinary discussion in our tumor board, we conceived of her as triple negative, that, that a biopsy of the abdominal wall showed metastatic breast cancer that was triple negative. Since that was easily, uh, it was only about one to two centimeters, easily amenable to surgical resection, we made the decision to resect that and then treat her with the Keynote 522 regimen. And she got through that. The abdominal wall was um, resected with a negative margin. And um, at the, she underwent bilateral mastectomy. Genetics uh, panel was negative. And it, she actually had a complete path CR with treatment effect in the breast and the lymph nodes as well as in the contralateral DCIS side. Um, initially, we were going to ask about whether to do consolidative RT, but Dr. Mamounis's uh, presentation to that in conjunction with the BR002, uh, since she initially had stage four disease, I think says no to radiation. So the questions are how long to continue the PEMBRO now? whether we just do the nine cycles like Keynote 522 or continue indefinitely since she was technically stage four, and whether to add on endocrine therapy since her core biopsy was weakly ER positive, though the rest of her uh, biopsy area, um, areas of involvement was triple negative. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm gonna just summarize. So 48-year-old premenopausal woman, clinical T2, uh, two, uh, uh, a biopsy proven N1, is that correct? correct. Uh, weekly positive, 21 to 30 percent in, in the breast, the, and the biopsy disease in the lymph node was, was uh, negative for ER, triple negative, and then a solitary abdominal wall met. You, you treated uh, her with the Keynote 522 regimen and then resected uh, the abdominal wall. And, and a, did, you, did you resect the abdominal wall met first and then ke chemotherapy? We did. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to start uh, maybe, Lori, with you. So the role of uh, surgery in the presence of stage four disease, um, you're, you're, oh, sorry, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, um, uh, Andrea. So your thoughts about the role of surgery in stage four disease here. Obviously, this is somewhat of a different scenario in the sense that uh, this is, uh, you know, again, a solitary a met. Of course, we think of these patients as having you know, circulating disease. We don't think of, we think of breast cancer as a systemic disease, but in this case, there was something we could see. It was, it was resected. Your thoughts on this? Um, this sounds a little bit different because it almost sounds like a drop met, like a, a skin met that just went, I've had one of those patients before. So it's a little bit different than maybe something in the bone or the liver or something else. Um, where we wouldn't operate. But in these instances of these kind of drop metastases that I've seen, um, I have done surgical resection um, in these cases. Um, but in your question about radiotherapy, and I'll let Lori answer this, I'm, I'm not sure she's the kind of patient that we describe in B51, <laughs> because I can't imagine if that drop med is in the radiation field that you would not want to consider that, especially if you've decided to treat her for cure you either, I think, in my opinion, you would go all the way and do that or not. So it sounds like you've done that with the keynote regimen, with aggressive local surgery, and would move on to complete therapy. Can you just clarify again where this uh, uh, abdominal wall metastases was? It was, it was I kind of also conceived of it as a drop med. It was really just right below the rib cage or, you know, or at the border of the rib cage. Um, so to me, it kind of seemed like a regional, you know, local regional. Uh, that's, not. you know, we kind of stretched a little bit, but that's how yeah. we kind of. So Dr. Pierce, maybe you could comment on the role of radiation theory. So uh, uh, very interesting. I mean, even if it's kind of in the neighborhood, this is a Met. I mean, this is not local regional. This is a Met. 
Um, I realize this is a 48-year-old, probably excellent performance status, um, and now she has a path CR. Um, I, I must say that this is actually a great case for multidisciplinary discussion because um, it's so, so complicated. So thank you for bringing this forward, and hopefully there was a multidisciplinary discussion at the uh, decisions were made or how to move forward. Um, this is someone that I don't think it's unreasonable to either resect it or to do radiation to that area. And as long as the patient understands that this is metastatic disease and the likelihood of us making a difference in her survival is pretty close to zero. But your, your reason for treating it would be more for local regional control. Um, but I, I can't say that it would make a difference in survival. Now that it's been resected, it is metastatic disease, and she had a path CR. Um, given, even though this is not typical for a B51, I would probably use that as a reason not to treat her. You would radiate the resected area. You said yes or no? I said if, no. So I said if, you she, would now not radiate. if she had not had surgery, you would radiate. I would have encompassed that. But now that she has had surgery to pass CR, I would not provide any radiation. To breast, node, or met. That's correct. Okay, thank you. So I think the follow-up follow question that you had then, so this patient has been rendered disease-free. Um, all disease has either been viewed as uh, uh, removed but with chemotherapy or surgery. So now your last question is related to duration of the pembrolizumab as well as endocrine therapy. So Hope comments on duration of pembrolizumab. I was just curious, did you check PD-L1 in the tumor? Um, we, I, I have to, I don't, I don't think we did. I don't think we did. Okay, I, I was remember. just curious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just interested, particularly because of the biomarker data with the ER positive high risk trials and the low ER having higher PDL1 and that predicting more PCR. It doesn't impact my recommendation, however, I was just interested. Yeah, I uh, and, you know, I think that in this situation, we would continue the Pembro as if a patient had metastatic disease, was treated on Keynote 355, and you dropped the chemo and continued Pembro. The study itself continued Pembro for two years, but I have to say, as an oncologist, I was always hesitant to stop at two years, and then I would just transition the patients over to compassionate use Pembro. Uh, but you know, and now in the clinical practice, you can continue on. Obviously, we stop for immune toxicities that uh, mandate stopping drug, and there is ongoing risk of toxicity over time. I think uh, you know the the duration of time, we don't even know how long to give trastuzumab for. So we really don't know the optimal duration of time. But in a couple of patients I have in that metastatic setting like this, I decided five years was the optimal duration. But, you know, that's like picking it out of the sky. Okay. And then, uh, Dr. Harbeck, what, what would you do with regard to endocrine therapy here? Do you think that plays a we, endocrine therapy plays a role? I think that... That is an important question because we're not just talking about endocrine therapy. I mean, if you think this to the end is heterogeneous tumor biology, you can also talk about CDK46 inhibitor therapy, which would, of course, then impact the decision give to give uh, pembrolizumab because you just couldn't give it together. So I think in, in the early breast cancer setting, when we have cases like between 1 and 9 ER, we call it functionally triple negative, and then we don't go back and revisit this decision because... Um, we, it's a lower ER status. There is more likely to be basal-like biology behind it. But 20 to 30 percent, usually I do recommend endocrine therapy. But I would, I mean, tell the patient if she really suffers from it and has trouble, that it's probably the benefit is not going to be as great as if the ER was, was higher. But it's heterogeneous biology. I mean, 20 percent is certainly positive. You cannot negate that and say, well, the rest is all triple negative. So I, I would talk to the patient, offer it to her with the CDK46, I, I, that's the decision. I probably would go more in the direction of the immunotherapy in this particular patient. And, but we could have also treated her according to 355 if her PDL1 was positive. You didn't need to give the uh, 522 regimen. That would, would have been my question as well. 
And, and, and we just recently had the ABC7 consensus in Lisbon with the advanced breast cancer, and there was a whole session on oligometastatic disease, and basically the, the whole panel uh, thought the same way you were thinking when you treated your patient, that basically we should give, a, we can do this with a curative intent, although we don't know whether it's actually going to impact the overall survival. I think uh, uh, one of the points that I would just like to make, this is the last point and we'll move on, and that is um, uh, it's important to note as we, you know, we begin to see the use of, um, we'll certainly begin to see the use of uh, pembrolizumab for the treatment of ER positive disease. Pretty critical that oncologists know that there have been multiple attempts to combine uh, abemaciclib along with um, yeah, checkpoint inhibitors, and those have all been abandoned because of severe toxicity. Uh, so there could be a tendency, I know, to, for some to just to put this all together and say, well, gee, let's, let's you know, let's be uh, you know, aggressive. But certainly uh, right now uh, there are, uh, there has been no ability to combine a bemaciclib and, 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 and a checkpoint inhibitor because of uh, really severe immune-related toxicity. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, uh, People can continue to come to the mics. Um, we're going to move to some questions that we have that are um, online. So um, because of lack of chairs, I would normally read out these questions, but I've asked uh, Dr. Rugo to read the question. So uh, Hope, why don't you pick out one? Uh, okay, so this is, uh, we'll start with this case just because it's quite similar uh, in terms of being heterogeneous. A 45-year-old woman with two tumors, 2.8, 2.5 centimeters, one is HER2 positive, one is triple negative. The FNA is positive in the axilla. So this is uh, two T2 tumors and node positive disease. How to approach neoadjuvant therapy here, anti-HER2 plus a checkpoint inhibitor, what would you do? And I have a similar case with a patient whose tumor is 5% HER2 positive with a copy number of 20, and the rest is triple negative. Okay, Dr. Pratt, your thoughts on uh, treating this patient's with neoadjuvant therapy. So the question is obviously chemotherapy, anti-HER2-based therapy, and then uh, would you add in uh, pembrolizumab or would you just sort of do this sequentially? What are your thoughts? <coughs> That's a difficult case. Uh, so first thought that I have is I would like to know in the, in the lymph node, uh, what is the HER2 status? Um, just to see if the lymph node uh, positivity is due to the HER2 positive component or, or the triple negative, that potentially could help me whether to approach um, as a priority the HER2 positive cancer or the triple negative, but I imagine we don't have that, that information, uh, so we need to assume uh, what to do. So, I mean, no doubt that I would use uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy in, in this case. And since we have a component that is triple negative, I do think that taxing carboplatin could be one of it. So potentially TCHP could be one approach. Um, but again, I can see the other argument. Um, also potentially TILs here could help me better understand this triple negative from a prognostic point of view, uh, if it is less or, or more progno better prognostic, in the sense that if the triple negative has substantial amount of TILs, and this, we don't have a cut point, I know, but just imagine now this triple negative has 60%, 70% TILs, it would reassure more and more not to use potentially immunotherapy, maybe just go for the chemo component and, and treat the HER2 positive with, with the right therapy. So these are my first initial thoughts. I don't know the others. What do you think? Okay, I think that's a really good point, and that is to say let's, let's find out. Obviously, the disease that's in the lymph node is probably going to drive, you know, uh, a lot of the risk for distant recurrence, not all of it, of course, uh, and really making sure you focus uh, uh, the systemic therapy uh, towards that. I think one of the questions comes up is, you know, are, you know, are there any data, <clears throat> you know, from a safety standpoint combining checkpoint inhibitor therapy along with... <clears throat> anti-HER2-based therapy, and, and I think the answer is certainly uh, the uh, people in GI oncology are already doing this, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, so, but certainly we are not doing it routinely in, in breast cancer. There, in, the, um, in the metastatic setting, the NRG trial closed in the first line metastatic setting because of hepatic toxicity, but is very unclear. You know, they were mandated to close. The neoadjuvant trial done by... Yeah, it that which was Joan. Yeah. Perfect. Anyway, they presented it as Mo and published it, but they didn't show an improvement in PCR. But they also showed no yeah. toxicity yeah. issues. 
Okay, well, why don't we move on to the next question. Microphone here. Hi, I'm Ashwini Bhatt, a medical oncologist from um, uh, Central Texas. I have a very similar case that Dr. Rugo presented right now, uh, but I'll take it a little forward from there. So this was a 65-year-old patient who came in with um, a two-centimeter mass in her right breast and uh, biopsy-proven node-positive disease. Uh, it was ER negative, PR negative in both the breast mass and the lymph node. Uh, it was HER2 negative actually on both sides, but staging scan at that point had showed a lung mass, um, a, a significant sized lung mass, almost a three centimeter lung mass. So we ended up biopsying that, which turned out to be a different histology, a mucoepidermoid tumor. So the pathologist took the liberty of going ahead and in, in a attempt to differentiate between the breast primary and um, the lung primary, she did a HER2 uh, fish analysis, although the HER2 IHC was zero on the breast primary and one plus on the uh, lymph node. Uh, she did a fish and it came back high, it came back amplified at 2.2 uh, to 2.8. So um, it's kind of left in a dilemma to kind of say, what do you do now? Do you treat it as a triple negative with the keynote 522 or use TCPH regimen? Um, and going forward, what would you do? Like uh, PCR, no PCR, like how would you treat this? Okay, sounds good. So just to review, this is a patient who has a node, uh, uh, node positive, essentially triple negative breast cancer. Staging workup was found to have a lung lesion. It was biopsied or resected. See, was, and eventually we resected the lung lesion also. Okay, so it's been completely resected at this point. And it's a uh, mucoepidermoid. It sounds like completely different histology, different yes. tumor. Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, Barbara, your thoughts on this case? Yes, uh, I think, so if I understand well, this patient has two different tumors. A lung tumor that is, uh, has been cured, or at least we can leave this to our colleagues that are in charge of lung cancer. And we are looking at a patient that is 65 years old with lymph node positive triple negative breast cancer. So I would treat this patient as a patient with a stage two or even stage three, it depends on the number of lymph nodes, uh, keynote 522, so it means uh, chemotherapy with carboplatin, taxol, pembrolizumab, and uh, anthracyclines. And I will, uh, perform surgery according to the, the, the type, the, the, the uh, reduction of the tumor can be lumpectomy or mastectomy, uh, lymph node axillary dissection, and uh, eventually also, according to the data that we have seen this morning, eventually consider also a, 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 a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and I will follow with the, the classical treatment, adjuvant pembrolizumab and radiotherapy, and uh, I think that uh, I would consider eventually the genetic test uh, according to our family history. And then in terms of this um, lung lesion, it's been completely resected. It seems like a different histology, you know, probably just continue to follow that with scans. Um, Erica, you have a comment. Oh, can I just add as well that, uh, you, know, th you said this patient's 65 years old? I mean, I, I become hesitant to offer anthracyclines to patients as they get older, particularly if there's cardiac risk factors. And one could consider a non-anthracycline regimen of a taxane, carboplatin, and pembrolizumab as an alternative to Keno 522. So yeah, this would be the, the, this, the Dr. Sharma regimen, we call it. Yes. Yeah. And then in, yeah. in some old, older people, the weekly, the every three-week docetaxel is tough, and then we just switch to weekly paclitaxel. Yeah. So that's even further step, but I've given that quite a lot to older patients. Very well tolerated. Okay. Microphone over here. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Carrillo, medical oncologist, Miami. Uh, the case, the question is about local regional uh, relapse and management. So it is, it's, this is a physician dermatologist uh, who five and a half years ago presented with a multicentric, invasive, classic lobular carcinoma, grade two. The largest tumor was 3.8 centimeter. It was ERPR more than 90%. HER2 was one plus. Uh, key 67 was 6% at the time. A uh, hair uh, surgeon ordered an oncotype. 
the largest tumor was an oncotype of 17, the second tumor was 15, the third tumor was very small and was not oncotyped. She had um, bilateral mastectomy, ipsilateral sentinel lymph node, and lymph node dissection. Ended up having three out of 12 positive lymph nodes. Uh, one was a macro, 2.2, the other two were micro metastatic. Um, and she went for multiple opinions, ended up having TC times four, no radiation recommended by multiple groups, and then had been on ovarian suppression AI and uh, with no evidence of recurrent disease until recently when she palpated in the inner upper quadrant very close to the largest tumor, a superficial nodule that ended up being <coughs> recurrent disease, invasive classic lobular carcinoma, one centimeter, excised and negative margins involving the muscle, the chest wall, but resected with negative margins. An ear pet induced by her, because her family member is a radiologist, was negative. And the question is, chemo versus no chemo, and the extension of radiation. She has had multiple um, recommendations by MD Anderson, Dana Farber, all contradictory. And so chemo versus no chemo, and by the way, her tumor now is PR negative, ER more than 90%, key 67 is 40%. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna just clarify a couple of things again for the panel here. So uh, when she was originally diagnosed after the bilateral mastectomy, did you say she did or did not get adjuvant radiation therapy? She didn't. She did not? Okay, and then with this uh, recurrence the, that she had, which is four years later, is that correct? Five and a half years. Five and a half years, thank you. And um, this recurrence is ER negative? ER more than 90% positive. ER more than 90%? ER negative. PR negative, her two. Key 67, well, her two is, is zero. Okay. And key 67 was 6% at presentation, this is 40% now. Okay, so so at this time, this local recurrence has been completely resected. Correct. All right, so um, now I'll turn over here to uh, uh, Dr. Pierce. <laughs> the case yeah, so um, the, I'm going to summarize the case again. Um, so this is uh, a woman who was 48 years old at the initial diagnosis, diagnosed with a multicentric uh, lobular breast cancer. The largest lesion was 3.8 centimeters. Uh, ERPR is strongly positive, HER2 negative, ki 67 low. Uh, Oncotype 17 and then 15 in another lesion. Um, after bilateral mastectomy, she was found to have a total of, I think I heard three, three. lymph nodes uh, out of 12 that were positive. She received adjuvant TC times four. She did not receive adjuvant radiation therapy. She was put on ovarian function suppression and she remains on ovarian su function suppression she, at this time, yes, yes or no? Yes, she's, she's on anastrozole now. She's okay. postmenopausal. Okay, thank, and she re so she's had an anastrozole throughout this whole period of time Absolutely. as well. Okay, so let's start with first, really, the I think the first question relates to the role of radiation therapy here. Dr. Pierce. The so, extension of uh, radiation, extension, because everyone has recommended radiation, but there has been differences some people recommend local radiation, other people have recommended comprehensive uh, nodal radiation. Okay. So she has a chest wall recurrence. Um, doesn't happen often, but we still do see it. And certainly the most common site of a subsequent recurrence is in the chest wall. And the, she had an AL and D initially. Um, and then the second most common site is in the superclav area. So I would irradiate um, the chest wall and the supraglav. I wouldn't irradiate the nodal, the full axillary area, and I would boost the scar. Um, so I would treat local regionally, but not comprehensively to the regional nodes. And just maybe one follow-up question. So the, uh, um, at the time of this local recurrence, was a PET scan performed? Yes, an ER PET. An that ER was PET was performed. Negative. Okay, thank you. So I think now the, the question is, we have a patient who's developed um, local um, uh, uh, progression or local recurrence uh, while on, one might say, optimal uh, endocrine therapy. Um, and so, um, Dr. Mayer, your thoughts about utilizing systemic therapy um, in terms of chemotherapy uh, and also in terms of your choice for future endocrine therapy? So can I just clarify, is the chest wall lesion still in place or was it resected? Resected, resected with negative margins. Okay. 
Um, I mean, so patients with chest wall recurrence, despite optimal systemic therapy, are at quite, quite high risk of distant recurrence. It's a great thing that her uh, PET scan was negative. Sometimes in these situations when the lesion is in place, we might offer uh, a more novel endocrine regimen, such as fulvestrin and a CDK4-6 inhibitor, sort of in a preoperative fashion to gauge uh, any residual endocrine sensitivity. Um, and then after resection, looking at factors, for example, KI-67, decide if we're going to offer chemotherapy or not. In this situation, as it's already resected, it's hard to do that sort of in vivo experiment. And given her younger age and, and high risk, I might be leaning towards offering her a comprehensive chemo regimen, such as dose dense AC plus T. But would you, um, sorry, can I ask her a question? Go ahead. Uh, would you, however, let's say you've done that or she says no way, and you're going to do your radiation, then what are you going to give her? I would still give her fulvestrin or CDK4-6 inhibitor. Yes, and in terms of endocrine options, she recurred on aromatase inhibitor, so we have to move on to something else, and fulvestrin CDK would tend to be my choice. So, Would you give chemo? So a, a couple of questions that come up. Obviously, this is an area of active uh, controversy, as Hope said. There are no data with regard to the role of uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. Also, as many of you know, we don't have data with regard to uh, I think we, this is an area certainly that would be a value of the role of Oncotype DX, uh, because we know from the Kaler study there was no benefit of chemotherapy, but clearly there's heterogeneity. We know that there will be uh, some tumors that are likely uh, uh, more or less endocrine sensitive, maybe more or less chemotherapy sensitive. So in the absence of the data, and this is where we have one of the, I would call, data-free zone, um, uh, the, the question is, Utilizing um, uh, these additional systemic therapies, fulvestrin, obviously not approved in this situation, CDK4-6 inhibitors not approved in this situation. And so, Hope, your thoughts on, on this as well. Um, no, I'm going to actually, so I'm going to pass it on to my European colleagues because they have lots of thoughts about this. But um, I think that she relapsed while taking anastrozole. Well, yeah. she was on anastrozole, yes. Yeah, so um, I do think that I've never had a problem getting approval for fulvestrin and a CDK4-6 inhibitor in this setting because it's essentially metastatic disease, right? Even if you've resected, like if you resect a liver lesion, you can still treat those patients. So I think the big for, so for me, that's non-controversial, but the chemo part is a little bit more controversial because she had chemo before. Well, I, so, would, I would probably also favor the CDK4-6 approach, but I would just caution in different, at least in different countries, it's not so easy to go off label. So in, in some countries, it's more advisable to leave the lesion inside because then you have a non-operable local yes. recurrence, and that is in the label of all three CDK4-6 inhibitor trials in the first-line setting. So uh, we need to think about these issues depending on where we <coughs> practice and how we could then yeah. prescribe the drug. The other thing is, if it's an in-breast recurrence, you can always say we cannot exclude a second breast cancer, and then we can treat according to label with the CDK4-6. So I completely agree with the CDK4-6, yeah. but we have to be careful where we practice and how we phrase the disease in order to, for the patient to be able to get that reimbursed. You know, I think that that's a, a re this is a, a really good point. I think, you know, increasingly what you're seeing um, is there's just uh, uh, more and more a move afoot to utilize the disease that's in front of you to gauge actually what's happening from a systemic therapy standpoint, especially, um, you know, in, in a scenario where we know the patient has likely micrometastatic disease. Uh, I, this, this is a really good discussion, and, and I want to ask one more question. This is to Dr. Pratt. Um, is there a role for sequencing this tumor uh, to make a decision about uh, hormonal therapy? Or would you just say, listen, there's progression on aromatase inhibitor, let's just move on to fulvestrin? I mean, the patient has been on therapy for five years, right? Uh, more yes, or less. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, it's a progression. Um, I don't see an argument to, to say that it is not, right? She was on therapy, right? And this yeah. tumor appeared, right? And Biologically speaking, uh, PR is negative, right? Key 67 is high, so it does suggest, as you pointed out, that the biology is leaning towards endocrine sensitivity, so uh, I would call it a, a progression, yeah. so therefore full western would be indicated. Okay. Her ESR, was, ESR1 was negative, no mutation. Can okay. I get a consensus on the chemotherapy issue? Sure. But I think in this situation, the view is still is that the progression on an astrozole probably moved to the next best endocrine therapy, which would be fulvestrin. Okay, let's go on to Thank the you. next question. Yeah, so this 
This young lady, she's 58 years old, and she presented in March, and she had a mammographically detected non-palpable mass that measured about 1.1 centimeters, and it was biopsied. And it was an uh, invasive ductal carcinoma with lobular features. Ultrasound and exam of the axilla were negative. She had a biopsy at the end of February, and it showed a triple positive cancer, ER 90%, PR 50%, HER2 3 plus by IHC. And because of the vagaries of the case, we also asked the lab to check fish, and it was indeed amplified. And we have egg on our face because she had lobular features. We did not do an MRI. We just assumed it was small. And she was given the APT regimen as a neoadjuvant, uh, and she had trouble with it. She got significant neuropathy to where she was dropping things and so on. So anyway, she got what we could give her, and then she had surgery in September, and she had bilateral mastectomies and a right sentinel node dissection in September. She had four negative nodes, three sentinel and one non-sentinel, but the tumor was much bigger than we thought. It extended over 5.5 centimeters, and she had piecemeal regression to an RCV2 level. And when we, uh, we asked them to run the uh, studies on her uh, residual tumor, it turned out to be ER 90%, PR 70%, HER2 2+, and non-amplified by fish. We also did mammoprint. We persuaded them to do that for us, and she came out high-risk luminal B uh, basically both times. So uh, she still has, the last I talked with her, significant issues with neuropathy, and our questions were, what do you do next for adjuvant? Okay. So can you just explain one more time the chemotherapy regimen was? She had weekly taxol, Herceptin, and Fergetta, about 10 cycles because we had to truncate it due to neuropathy. Okay. Okay. So just to summarize again the case, 58-year-old female who presented with a palpable lesion in her, in, her, in her breast, this was clinically about a one-centimeter lesion? Not, actually, it was non-palpable. Non-palpable. Mammographically detected. Thank you. Uh, invasive, uh, uh, lobular histology, correct? It, it, had lobular features. In lobular there. features, uh, triple positive, initially confirmed by IHC 3 plus in fish, uh, was treated with weekly paclitaxel along with uh, trastuzumab. Did receive progetta or did not? Oh, I'm sorry, she did. She just got her septum. Okay, and had uh, had to stop after about 10 weeks because of neuropathy, taken to the operating room, and at the time of the operating room, the case that was found to be much larger than originally thought. Uh, uh, and then was uh, lymph node negative by sentinel lymph node. I think you said a total of four lymph nodes were examined. And the pathological size of the tumor at the time of surgery was over five centimeters. It spread over a five centimeter area, but there was most major regression, so it was like popcorn. Sure. Okay. So I think this is a classic example, uh, obviously, of tumor heterogeneity. Um, so, um, Dr. Uh, 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 Pistilli, I'm wondering if you could comment at this point the patient is, um, you know, has a fair amount of residual disease. The disease that's remaining appears to be HER2 negative. Your thoughts on additional systemic therapy? Yes. Uh, again, uh, maybe there are some differences between Europe and, uh, and United States for sure. This patient has not received antracycline, so I would, uh, I would give uh, a, a treatment with antracycline, say pyrubicin or uh, diamicin in combination with cyclophosphamide. Actually, we did. I, I, for, I totally forgot to tell you that we did give her AC. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we didn't. Right. Sorry, we didn't catch this AC. part. Huh? <laughs> All right. So, so uh, she, you, she, can I just clarify? She received AC and then stop. and then paclitaxel. No, no. She got taxol herceptin. When we did the surgery, we found out that we didn't do so good, and she got four cycles got of AC postoperatively. Okay. Thank you. So uh, that helps. That's helpful. So, uh, Barbara, additional comments. Okay. So she has already received antracyclines after surgery. Is this correct? Post, yes. Postoperatively. Okay. Okay. Uh, Post op. And now the question is what, what else, what we can do? Right. Uh, so, in the residual disease at the time of surgery, she's ER positive or ER negative. I don't, I didn't she's catch this. ER part. positive. ER, ER positive. positive. So, what I would do for this patient is the best endocrine therapy as best. Uh, for sure, I, I leave to the colleagues or radiotherapists and so on to, to discuss the, radio, the, the, the radiotherapy treatment, radiotherapy, but I would provide in terms of systemic therapy the best uh, endocrine therapy. She's uh, 50 years old. I would consider uh, for sure arom uh, aromatase inhibitors, 
in combination eventually with ovarian fun function suppression if she's not um, a, a postmenopausal patient. And I would provide, if it is approved in your country, a CDK for six inhibitors such as abemaciclib. Okay. So another question I have here is um, obviously that, that yeah. there's going to be some question of whether we can get the CDK46 inhibitor approved. Um, uh, did she have, um, initially when she presented, was there any lymph node involvement? Uh, no, no, there wasn't. Okay. So that could be a potential issue of getting that approved. Um, I did have a question for uh, Dr. Pratt. In this case, would, uh, you know, the tumor was HER2 positive, what's remain is not. Would you continue on with the year of trastuzumab in this situation as well? I mean, here, one question back to you would be, if I understand correctly, at diagnosis, it was HER2 3+. Plus, but it was HER2 3+, plus, and because of the surgical pathology, we asked the lab to go back and do FISH, and they did, and it was amplified. Okay. The so presentation. Okay. Afterwards. So okay. I lost also this part, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the, the data, we don't have data saying that if a tumor becomes HER2 negative after new adjuvant therapy, no, you don't benefit from TDM1, for example, right? Actually, the data, despite the small numbers uh, of, of samples in Catherine, it does suggest that there is, there is a benefit. Um, however, the jury, the jury is, is out. Um, so in this case, if it's a HER2 amplified tumor, I think we need to consider it HER2 positive, and therefore I do think that TDM1 would be indicated in, in this case. There is a toxicity no, that the patient had that also is of concern regarding uh, the use of TDM1, but, um, yeah, could be indicated. So I was hoping that she would get better, that her neuropathy would improve during the window of AC, mm -hmm. and maybe we could go back to TDM1. My question to the panel is, would you use endocrine therapy concurrently with TDM1, or would you do it sequentially? I think yes. we would all yes. do it concurrently. Yeah. Well, Dr. Harbuck, you have a uh, comment here as well. Yeah, I was just going to make the same comment about TDM1 in this subgroup analysis from, from Catherine. I mean, it, we also have data in, in high-risk HR positive, HER2 positive, that one additional year of neratinib could be of benefit. But since the tumor um, in the non-PCR was so much larger and HER2 negative, I would also uh, weigh on the side of the CDK46. Abema is not approved in this setting because she's never had node positive disease, although the tumor is very large now. But, but probably once Natalie is approved, that would fit then these criteria. So we can wait a little with that. Although those trials excluded HER2 positive disease, I agree with you. I mean, I think that most of us would consider that if she couldn't tolerate TDM1, you can use endocrine therapy, CDK46 inhibitor potentially. Yeah, I mean, you can't exclude that these are, like Matt said, mixed, heterogeneous, yeah. heterogeneous biology. Yeah. So I think we point. have a good argument because the second tumor is so much larger that this is actually yes. two biologies, so we need to treat both of them. So I think one of the take-home points here is just that, you know, in a tumor that was originally HER2 positive, at the time of surgery is HER2 negative. That does not preclude then the use of TDM1. That was an analysis from Catherine. Obviously, you'll have to deal with the issue of neuropathy in, 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 uh, in terms of managing that from a patient perspective, and then potentially to consider a CDK4-6 inhibitor along with endocrine therapy and, of course, use of uh, a bisphosphonate as well. Let's move on to the next uh, can microphone. I, can I just ask, oh, actually, one more follow-up. In terms of local regional therapy, um, you said that she was clinically node negative initially. That was clinical, it wasn't biopsy, correct? But then at time of surgery, her nodes were negative. Yes, she had a negative ultrasound, no palpable disease in her axilla, and at time of surgery, she had a sentinel node procedure, which yielded three negative sentinel nodes and one negative non-sentinel node. And there was no treatment effect in those nodes? This I don't. Well, I don't know. No, I guess not. Okay, so, so let's just assume that her axilla was fine, but she still had greater than five centimeters, kind of a, a Swiss cheese kind of, uh, and I would advocate for radiation to the chest wall only because of her T3 disease. I certainly would do it in the, in, in the non-neoadjuvant setting. I'm even more compelled to do it in the neoadjuvant setting. Well, would, you, would you, Dr. Pierce, would you do that like right away? I mean, that would also give her more time to recover from her neuropathy. I'm sorry, would, would I do that when? What? I think the question is the timing of the TDM1 and radiation. And I think the, if you look at the Catherine trial, they did do it concurrently, I believe, in TDM1 yeah. along. But I think you could argue going forward with the radiation therapy, giving right. her on endocrine therapy, giving her a chance to recover. Yeah. So I, I think I, that's reasonable. In this case, given her neuropathy, I would go first. Yeah. Thank Let's you. go over to this microphone over here. 
following up on the tumor heterogeneity questions that have been raised uh, and making uh, decisions regarding neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In the case that we discussed, there was a breast which was HER2 positive and the axilla was negative. Does the panel feel there's any role for a test like Blueprint to understand biology, is this really HER2 positive or not, and then make decisions regarding chemotherapy regimens? Okay, I'm sorry, not quite. A test like, what was, what did you say? Blueprint agenda is okay. understanding luminal versus HER2 versus basal. Would you use that as an adjunct to making these decisions? Yeah, I, I, I would say that it, it can provide additional information, but I think what we would say in this situation is we would go by the Catherine data, which actually looked at this specific question, which says there's still value of getting, in this case, TDM1, uh, uh, regardless of whether HER2 is lost at the time of surgery. I meant more in the neoadjuvant setting. Okay. Dr. Getz. Um, so a question here, we'll, we'll address this quickly, Util, utilizing a different additional test to make treatment decisions, in this case, the blueprint test. I hope your thoughts on that. Using, uh, because the comment was that it was luminal B? Correct. Yeah, I am, um, you know, I think that we think of HER2 positive, HER2 enriched as having really fabulous responses. They have a higher PCR rate than luminal B. But uh, luminal B disease, we, when it's shown to be HER2 positive, we treat the same way. So it's not going to really alter your treatment decision. And even a HER2 enriched tumor, if it happens to be ER positive, you're still going to give adjuvant endocrine therapy. So I don't really see that as altering our therapy. Now, in this particular patient, you know, where her, some of the, there is clearly tumor heterogeneity, the heterogeneity is really driving our decision rather than the blueprint results. Yeah, yeah. Okay, microphone. Hello, um, I'm a medical oncologist from Edinburgh. Um, this is a case that's really divided our MDT, and it's a 60, sorry, 57-year-old lady. She's very fit. And she actually presents via the ENT surgeons with a, a big neck mass in the SCF. And she's found to have um, GATA3 positive, strongly ER positive, HER2 positive disease. And she has staging and she has a, a lesion in the right breast. It's about three and a half centimeters with one or two abnormal nodes on CT. And she has a few little lymph nodes up in level five in the uh, cervical region. Um, so we felt she was definitely M1, and she had the Cleopatra triplet, and she did very well and had a complete radiological response. Um, this was a neck mass that you could see, um, you know, if, if you were the patient there, you could see this mass, it was big. Um, so we'd said to her, this was not likely to be a curable disease, but clearly could do extremely well. And the question really is, um, do we do surgery and radiotherapy? Um, the radiation oncologist feels she can get the field up um, to take into account all of the disease, but she can also treat the breast. Now, the patient herself doesn't really want a mastectomy, but someone has said to her, we could treat this radically, and she really wants us to guide her. But she can't obviously have a huge radiotherapy field to include um, the breast as well. So if she wants to go down this route, she would have to have a mastectomy, clearance, and then the radiotherapy. Um, and none of us really know how best to guide her. I personally think she's had a great response, and we've got lots of um, other, disease, uh, other treatments in the background. But um, we are really divided on this. I wonder what the panel thought. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'll just summarize. So uh, this is a 57-year-old female who presented with a very large neck mass, uh, a biopsy proven to be ERPR, ERPR positive, HER2 positive, also found to have disease in the right breast, uh, as well as right axilla, is that is that yes. right? Yeah, that's okay. Right. So I think at this point the patient's been treated appropriately with the Cleopatra regimen, has a complete response. So I'm going to uh, um, move to you, Dr. Barrio. Uh, your thoughts about surgical resection of the breast, uh, as well as more aggressive local regional therapy uh, to these lymph nodes in the neck. I think I just have a couple of additional questions. Was this a supraclavicular node, or was this a cervical node? So the big mass was supraclavicular, but on CT PET, she had two positive um, so it was, level five cervical So nodes. it was superclav N3, not M1? It was the yes. neck nodes that we felt made her M1. They call it M1. It was mostly uh, superclav, but I think you're saying there was a couple of uh, lesions that were higher up as well that would have potentially made this. So she had some this... cervical disease yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I see. Um, 
so in this setting of kind of more advanced disease that was going all the way up the neck, I, I probably would not offer her surgery. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't do it in a rush. I mean, I think you have plenty of time to let her declare herself and see if she's going to relapse. Um, and uh, if she ends up doing really well over time, I think you can consider surgery at that time. But right now, I don't think you're going to give her a survival advantage by operating on her um, at this point. And I would just continue the systemic therapy that she's on, the, her two therapy. Dr. Rugo, you have a comment. I, I had a patient sort of like this, right? Young woman uh, got, went to the Philippines, got married, came back, and didn't have her period anymore, and uh, went to various doctors complaining of a mass in her neck for months uh, while pregnant. So we saw her with a really massive cervical adenopathy and a huge mass in her axilla and a relatively small breast mass, uh, not ER positive, but HER2 positive, ERPR negative, HER2 positive. And so, of course, she had to get treated during pregnancy, so it was very complicated. Um, and in fact, her disease really only went away when we gave the same chemo with trastuzumab and pertuzumab after she, we delivered her a little bit early. And, uh, and then she had no disease that we could find anywhere. So we did take her to surgery. And again, you know, we don't really know. It's like, you know, this is a really tough situation. And, you know, very young woman, uh, and she had no residual disease. So now we're going to radiate her because it's all within a regional field. And I sort of feel like we made it up that if the nodes were supraclavicular, it was okay. But if they were just a little higher, it wasn't. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me. So that's how I treated that patient. And, you know, I told her she's going to be on antibodies forever, and so she might not have another kid near I, in the I near future. I think what I'm saying is that you don't have to rush, right? I mean, I think that's great that There's she's no had hurry. a great I response. I waited three months, actually. In yeah, her case, I, mean, I usually wait six. And I, you know, as much as we love to kind of separate out the HER2 positive patients because they're such great responders to systemic therapy, we still don't really have any randomized data showing that surgery in stage four disease improves survival or outcome. And so, you know, especially if you're thinking about a big surgery that might change or alter her quality of life, I don't really know what the rush is, and I would give her some time, and I wouldn't, I even though it's cervical nodal disease, I know you disagree, Lori, um, I, I don't think that I would no, I consider it local people, regional. We should wait, because you want to wait and make sure that on HP their disease is not going to rush back, and I've seen that before. So, you know, I, I wait, uh, but then I... For HER2 positive disease, it's where I do yeah. surgery and radiation. So just a, uh, one last comment. So uh, Dr. Pierce, while the surgeons are waiting, would you <laughs> radiate? No. <laughs> I would love to treatment plan this person and try to irradiate all the area. I mean, I agree that she has M1 disease, but there's M1 disease and then there's M1 disease. It's all in the neighborhood, right? And, um, and given the fact that her superclav was, was positive, it's not shocking that the next echelon of nodes were involved. So I would love to treatment plan this. And I, I'm not quite clear why the radiation oncologist who, who knows the case felt that they couldn't do the breast, too. I mean, I, there's a way to match fields, and you could do the regional area as well as the breast area. And she's had a complete response. Um, I would add, again, she, her, presumably her performance status is very good it's and you want to be aggressive. Yeah. I would be very interested in trying to treat my plan and, and treat her. So would you do that in the absence of surgery, though? If the surgeon wants to wait. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's been, she has a complete response, not only clinically, but radiographically. So clinically, she's a complete responder. I would actually move forward. But okay. then you're going to be complicated with the surgery, so you would just do radiation? Yeah, I, would just, I would just do radiation. And no? Correct. As long as, you know, you've imaged her and you are clear that there is no gross residual disease, I think, I think we're dealing with microscopic, yeah. local, regional, and M1, and I think that that would be totally incomp You could treat that with radiation. Okay. Uh, we have about seven minutes remaining, and I have, we have, we're going to go with one last uh, uh, case. Thank you. Um, I have a 54-year-old female, ER positive, stage 2, diagnosed initially 2010, finished her surgery, uh, dose density ACT, RT, seven years of ET. Um, in 2021, she became metastatic um, in the bone. Biopsy was GATA3 positive, ER positive, HER2 negative. Started first line, abema, exmastane. She's been on it stable until October of 2023. She had worsening Disney of exertion, chest pain, staging showed pleural effusion, 
um, six centimeter posterior mediastinal mass and uh, retroperitoneal uh, lymphadenopathy. Um, the lymph nodes were biopsied, the retroperitoneal, and were GATA3 positive, triple negative, KI67 at 60%, compatible with breast primary. The posterior mediastinal mass was GATA3 negative, uh, KI67 95%, and read as small cell cancer. Um, and was stained, and it's triple negative, ERPR HER2 negative. Um, so the question is, how can we figure if these are two primaries or a neuroendocrine transformation in the breast? Would a molecular classifier help or send in an NGS uh, uh, on, on either tumor? And also, how would you approach this case from a treatment standpoint? Would you use a, a small cell regimen like a platinum and etoposide or, or, or just Daxol, and we hope for the best. Sure. It sounds like the patient probably needs chemotherapy sooner rather than later. Um, uh, and this disease is uh, ER negative. Um, so I think, I think most people would feel very comfortable with treating her, you know, with a platinum-type regimen. I guess the question that comes up here is, uh, would, um, would you pursue, uh, essentially, you have two different uh, histologies, and you're asking, should we go after, you know, NGS on these two different histologies? Are two different uh, areas to, to, you know, to help us with our uh, treatment decision making. So, Dr. Rugo, your thoughts on this case? So can you just summarize? Yep, what you I'll just summarize it again. So, it what, what I heard was this was uh, a 54 year old female with a prior history of ER positive stage 2 breast cancer, uh, previously treated with adjuvant uh, AC Taxol, uh, seven years of endocrine therapy. I'm assuming most of that was an AI. And then in 2021, she presented with bone disease that was ER positive. Received a bemaciclib, um, I'm assuming fulvestrant maybe, was that what she got? Uh, and then had uh, essentially two years on that, and now she has what's essentially, um, um, you know, various areas. She's got a pleural fusion, she's got a large mass, and you've biopsied a couple different areas, and they look like there's tumor heterogeneity. One is a, a classic uh, sort of a uh, IDC that is um, triple negative, the other appears to be more small cell, is what I hear. I will say small cell is a bad, a bad histology in breast cancer. But, you know, we are, I think as we're biopsying more and more, we're seeing more of these patients who don't look like they should have lost all of the ER in their tumor, but they have. You know, we biopsy the liver most commonly, and it's triple negative. So I think that you are somewhat obliged to treat the patient uh, for the histology you identify. And in that situation, actually, patients are eligible for first-line chemotherapy studies for triple negative breast cancer as well. So that would be one consideration in that setting where we're looking at ADCs versus standard chemotherapy. Uh, but, you know, I would check PDL one and see what's going on with that patient and treat them as triple negative. You know, I think that some of those patients then say, well, should I continue the hormone therapy for the bone lesions? But in general, then, you know, that complicates your treatment plan and may add toxicity. So we generally treat for the biology we found. Now, I will say, if you biopsy the bone and it was triple negative or a pleural fusion, you have to be careful because we get false negatives in that setting. Okay. Well, thank you very much to everybody who participated and also to all of our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it.